Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this presentation of the thermoscientific map on Spira surface. The successful outcome of any cell culture experiment depends very much upon your chosen cell culture surface and the interplay of the surface with your cell culture medium. Today, I'd like to give you an overview of existing cell culture environments, highlight the benefits of three dimensional suspension cultures over two dimensional monolayer cultures, and illustrate to you how our new surface, Nunclon Spira, is able to support the three dimensional culture of cells in suspension. For many years, cell culture has been a very valuable tool for modeling and studying physiological and pathological processes. And traditionally, the cells of interest are cultured on cell culture treated polystyrene surfaces in a monolayer. And this two dimensional approach results in a very well controlled and homogeneous environment in which cells grow at a relatively uniform rate. And this is because the cells are exposed to an equal concentration of oxygen, nutrients, and metabolic base products. In a modeling or a drug screening setting, the cells are also, of course, exposed to an equal concentration of any compounds applied extracellularly. However, the main limitation of this conventional cell culture approach is that it simply does not mimic the three-dimensional multicellular arrangement and the complex cell-cell and cell matrix interactions that you find in vivo. And as such, these two-dimensional cell culture approaches lack any type of physiological barriers which, for example, create up gradients of oxygen or nutrients. In contrast, three-dimensional culture systems really are of far greater physiological relevance. And this is because they enable the spontaneous aggregation of cells into microscale spherical cell clusters, which we all refer to as cell spheroids. Due to their multicellular arrangement, cell spheroids exhibit distinctive zones, as you can see in this image. The outermost layer is made up of a zone of proliferative cells, as you have the highest concentration of oxygen and nutrients, but the lowest concentration of metabolic waste products. This is followed by the quiescent zone, which is a layer of dormant and non-dividing cells. And the reason the cells are dormant and non-dividing is because of a shortage of oxygen and nutrients. And larger spheroids also have dead cells at their center, and this is referred to as the necrotic core. So since cell spheroids represent very critical physiological parameters that we find in vivo, such as a multicellular architecture and the barriers to mass trans transport, they represent very versatile and powerful tools which can be applied to a range of uh, different applications. So in cancer research, they are applied to study tumor progression. They also serve as very good models to uh, screen uh, drugs as they show a greater chemotherapeutic resistance compared to the same cells in a monolayer. And of course, they are also very valuable to the area of stem cell research. So spheroids are, as an example, created from pluripotent stem cells, which we refer to as the embryoid bodies, or just EBs in short. And since embryoid body formation is a commonly used method to initiate the differentiation of pluripotent stem cells, they are very valuable tools to deduce the developmental processes underlying differentiation and this knowledge can, of course, be applied to the area of regenerative medicine. Similarly, if you use patient-specific cells, embryoid bodies can be very valuable to deduce the causes of any developmental disorders. Thermo Fisher Scientific now offers an exciting new product specifically developed to support the three-dimensional culture of cell spheroids, Thermo Scientific Nunclon Sphera. The special feature of Nunclon Sphera is its hydrophilic polymer coated surface, which has a neutral charge. And it's the combination of the polymer's hydrophilicity and neutral charge which gives Nunclon Sphera its low binding properties. So, as a result, ionic and hydrophobic interactions are prevented from occurring. And as many of you will know, the hydrophobic and ionic interactions are the two main factors which facilitate the absorption of extracellular matrix proteins and cell attachment. So by inhibiting cell attachment altogether, the nunclon sphera surface initiates the interaction between the cells, ultimately resulting in spheroid formation. And it is in this way that the nunclon sphera surface supports the formation of three-dimensional uh, cultures. I'd, to, I'd like to now take a look at uh, the performance of the nunclon sphera surface. 
So to test the low binding properties of an unclean sphere surface, a series of experiments was performed, and specifically, we verified that extracellular matrix proteins are not absorbed, that cell attachment is in fact inhibited, that cell viability and pr proliferation are maintained, and that spheroid formation is supported across a range of cell types. So to test the extent of extracellular matrix protein absorption, we incubated the nuclear sphere surface with fluorochrome conjugated collagen and fibronectin. And as a positive control for extracellular matrix protein absorption, we included the nuclear delta surface. The nuclear delta surface is our standard cell culture treated surface, which is used for the culture of, of adherent cells. So you'll all be familiar with this type of graph. Um, what we did was, after our 24 hour incubation period, we, uh, we rinsed our surfaces and then we um, measured the fluorescent intensity as a measure to determine how many cells, or sorry, how many, uh, as a measure of the amount of protein uh, that had bound. So of course, a high fluorescent intensity reading indicates that protein had bound to a large extent, and a low fluorescent intensity reading indicates that very little protein had been absorbed to the surface. And you can see very clearly that the uh, very little extracellular matrix proteins had actually absorbed to the nuclear sphere surface. And I'd just like to draw your attention to the, the break and the y-axis on the left-hand side. So compared to our nuclear delta surface, the nuclear sphere surface shows minimal interaction with the extracellular matrix. And this already suggests that the nuclear sphere surface inhibits cell attachment. So the next step for us was to verify that the nuclear sphere surface does inhibit cell attachment. And for this purpose, we selected three adherent cell lines. They included the monkey kidney epithelial cell line Barrow, the human lung carcinoma cell line A549, and the human pre-monocytic cell line U937. And for the purpose of these experiments, we differentiated these cells to macrophage-like cells. And what these cell lines have in common are their very strong adherent properties. Again, as a positive control for cell attachment, we included the nuclear delta surface. So after our incubation period, the surfaces were again rinsed, residual cells were lysed, and the number was quantified using a fluorescent assay. The results that you see here are normalized to our positive control of the nuclear delta surface, and you can see that there is virtually no cell attachment on the nuclear sphere surface. So taken together, the low binding properties of the nuclear sphere surface are highlighted by minimal absorption of extracellular matrix proteins and also very low attachment of otherwise uh, adherent cell lines. So having shown that cells don't actually attach to the nuclear sphere surface, it was also very important for us to demonstrate that the nuclear sphere surface does not inhibit normal cell growth. So for the purpose of this experiment, we plated mouse cancer stem cells into a nuclear sphere and rounded bottom 96 microwell plate at five different densities. We then monitored spheroid formation and also growth over a period of five days. And what we observed was normal cell growth. At the lowest seeding density, we saw an increase in spheroid volume of approximately six and a half fold. And at the highest seeding density, we saw an increase of two and a half fold. So depending on your specific application, you can influence both the rate of spheroid growth and the volume that the spheroid obtains by simply defining your initial seeding density. But irrespective of the seeding density, what these results show is that EBs, sorry, that spheroids form and that they grow in volume over time, indicating that the nuclear sphere surface does support cell survival and proliferation. We then went on to show that the nuclear sphere surface supports spheroid formation across a range of cell types. And in the first instance, we demonstrated the performance using a range of cancer cells. We set up these spheroid cultures by plating 20,000 cells in our well of a six well dish, and we maintained the cells in serum containing medium for a duration of one week. And visual inspection shows that the nuclear sphere surface consistently supports spheroid formation across the cell lines. In order to quantify the functionality of the, spheroid, of the sphere surface, we counted the number of spheroids that were formed and determined both spheroid size and, and cell viability upon dissociation. 
the discrepancies that you can see between spheroid count and spheroid size can be attributed to differences, inherent differences between the cell lines. But what the data shows clearly are uh, some inverse relationships. Firstly, between spheroid count and spheroid size, which you can expect when you plate cells at a defined density. And secondly, between spheroid size and viability. And the second observation can be explained by the fact that the larger the spheroid, the greater the number of dead cells at its center. So many of you may be asking yourselves now, we just use a non-treated polystyrene surface to create our three-dimensional cell spheroids. But does it work every time? Does it work across cell lines? And does it work with all media compositions? The non-treated polystyrene surface can support spheroid formation, but the main limitation of the non-treated polystyrene surface is that it can only support spheroid cultures when it is used in combination with cell culture medium which does not contain any serum. When you use, non when you use the non-treated polystyrene surface in combination with serum-containing medium, as in this particular experiment, you can see that the non-treated polystyrene surface does not support spheroid formation at all. Instead, you see cell attachment across all, all, cell, all, all cell lines. It also, therefore, is comparable to our negative control for spheroid formation, the nuclear delta surface. So the, expl the explanation for this phenomenon is that the non-treated polystyrene surface is hydrophobic with a neutral charge, and therefore, when used in combination with serum-containing medium, any proteins contained within the serum are able to adsorb to the surface through hydrophobic interactions and thereby facilitate cell attachment. In contrast, the, the nuclear sphere surface being hydrophilic with a neutral charge, is able to support spheroid formation even in the presence of serum in your culture medium. We then extended our studies using both mouse and human embryonic stem cells. In the first instance, we set up embryoid bodies for mouse embryonic stem cells by plating 60,000 cells in a well of a six-fold plate. And what you can see is, is again, using the three different culture surfaces, it's only the nuclear sphere surface which is able to support EV formation. And the reason for this, of course, is since there was serum present within the culture medium. Cell viability across the three cultures remains very comparable, though. We then repeated these experiments using human embryonic stem cells. And as expected, we saw cell attachment and even signs of adhesion-mediated differentiation on the nuclear delta surface but both the nuclear sphere surface and the non-treated surface were able to support EB formation from human embryonic stem cells, and EB formation looked good on both surfaces. So in this particular instance, the non-treated surface was able to support spheroid formation since there was no serum in the culture medium. As I mentioned earlier, EB formation is one approach by which the differentiation of pluripotent stem cells can be initiated. So in our final set of experiments, it was very important for us to demonstrate that the nuclear sphere surface fully supports the differentiation of human embryonic stem cell-derived embryoid bodies into cells of the three developmental germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So for this purpose, we performed both spontaneous and directed differentiation, and specifically, we cultured the human embryonic stem cell-derived embryoid bodies on the nuclear sphere surface for a week, prior to plating them onto a coated nuclear delta surface, and we maintained the cultures for up to 21 days in vitro. And as you can see from these images, immunofluorescent staining of the differentiated cells reveals expression of germ layer-specific markers. What they also reveal is the characteristic morphology expected of each individual cell type. So specifically, the cells which differentiated towards an ectodermal fate express the early neuronal marker beta tubulin 3, and they also show an intricate new, uh, network of neuronal processes. The cells which differentiated towards the mesodermal fate show the tight bundling of long, thin actin filaments within smooth muscle cells. And finally, cells which differentiated towards an endodermal fate show a reticular staining pattern of alpha feta protein within oval-shaped hepatocytes. So these results show clearly that the nuclear delta surface fully supports the differentiation of human embryonic stem cell-derived embryoid bodies into cells of the three developmental germ layers. 
So in summary, the Nunklon Sphere surface has been specifically developed for the purpose of culturing three-dimensional spheroids and embryoid bodies or any other cell type that you wish to culture um, in suspension. The low binding properties of Nunklon Nunclon Sphere are highlighted by its minimal adsorption of extracellular matrix proteins and its very low adhesion of typically adherent cell lines. I've also shown you that compared to the non-treated polystyrene surface, Nunclon Sphere is superior in performance across a range of cell types and importantly supports spheroid formation even in the presence of serum in your culture medium. And as such, the Nunclon Sphere surface will enable you to get very consistent and reproducible results. Finally, I've also shown that the Nunclon Sphere surface supports differentiation of stem cells via an embryoid body stage into cells of the three germ layers. Nunclon Sphere is a ready-to-use product. It is free of any animal components and it comes with a four-year shelf life from the date of manufacture. In addition to the performance tests that I've just outlined in detail, the Nunclon Sphere surface is also subjected to a number of quality assurance tests. And these certify that Nunclon Sphere is non-pyrogenic and biologically inert. And on every product you will also find this turquoise dot pattern. And this is actually an indicator tape which allows you to see at a glance that the product has been exposed to the ethylene oxide gas sterilization procedure. Thermo Fisher Scientific offers an Anclon Sphere in a wide range of different formats, both closed and open. The closed formats include the cell culture easy flasks with a cell culture area of 25 or 75 square centimeters, a 24 well, a 12 well, or a 6 well multi dish, a 35, a 60, or a 90 millimeter dish, and the round bottomed or a flat bottomed micro well plate. We also have a brochure and two accompanying application notes, which you can find online on the Thermo Scientific website, or alternatively, you can collect your copies at our booth, and we look forward to seeing you there. So I'd like to thank you for coming and for showing your interest in Thermo Scientific Nunclon Sevira. Thank you, Laura. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, beautiful presentation. Can I have the mic? And uh, the presentation has made my work uh, difficult because I'm the next speaker. Um, my question is, as being a, a heavy user of this uh, uh, surface, um, I'm still learning that um, using serum for differentiating is making a difference I mean, uh, between the non-treated one and the sphere surface. How about BSA? Because this is one of the major components of serum. We haven't tested BSA directly, but I would assume that if you had a significant concentration of BSA within your cell culture medium, that could also facilitate cell attachment. But that's certainly something that, that we can follow up on. Right. What I concentration of BSA are you, are you thinking of? Uh, I'm using at five milligram per mil. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We haven't done experiments with, with BSA in, in this context, but we've done some other experiments. And you can see that if you add BSA to a non-treated surface, they will adhere in clumps on the surface. So I guess that that will affect also the homogeneity of, of your experiments. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you, Laura.